All right, hi everybody. This is your Ron Brooks show, uh, and uh, you're listening uh, to my post-election analysis. We're also trying something uh, new today. I'm trying, and I don't think I've quite succeeded in uh, getting the show on Facebook Live. So, uh, y you know, I, let's see if uh, if this is actually working. And uh, you know, some of my uh, one thing says yes, Facebook says no. Somebody uh, text me or let me know if it's actually working or not. It looks like it is not. So uh, um, let's see. Um, don't know. Don't know if it's working or not. All right. Let's uh, let's focus on the show. And uh, you know, I prefer that you don't listen on both because actually uh, then my statistics kind of my my data gets all screwed up so my preference is that you actually uh, you know listen to it on blog talk radio because I get better data there but I know that blog that uh, Facebook live is really cool but I prefer that you do one or the other and not both now uh, whoops okay let me mute because I'm also hearing myself on Facebook okay it's actually working so cool all right, let's uh, let's get on with the show. Uh, you know, a shocker this week, at least to, to many people, a shocker. Uh, I was shocked. I was surprised. Although I, I in many conversations, I predicted this. I said that if uh, the polls were within a few percentage points, two to three percentage points the day before for Clinton, it was likely that Donald Trump would win. Uh, I also uh, also find it really interesting and something to really be thought about and discussed and and analyzed is the fact that the polls have now been systematically wrong over and over and over again for about a year. So if you think back to uh, the Israeli election, to the Greek election, to the British election, to Brexit, and now to the U.S. election, all of these elections have, uh, the polls have got them wrong, and all of them have got them wrong in the same direction, which is also interesting. All of them uh, had a bias towards the left. All of them predicted that the left would do significantly better than it actually did. Uh, or, or in the case of Brexit, I don't know if Brexit is right or left, but in the case of Brexit, they predicted that the, you know, what, what we generally, I guess, generally in the population is considered the left position of state. I guess in Brexit, it doesn't really hold, but the state position uh, would win. So all of them, in a sense, had the same bias. And I think it's that, you know, that fact is really interesting and I'm, I'm trying to move the microphone so that um, those on Facebook don't just see microphone uh, that uh, there's actually a, a face there as well uh, we'll see if that works all right um, so so that's point one the whole polling issue the whole issue of analyzing poll the whole issue of what seems to be a systemic bias uh, within the polls is I think a fascinating issue and something uh, that needs to be analyzed, needs to be discussed. And I, I believe that people are going to be doing that in the weeks and months to come because it's not just a random bias, clearly. It's a very specific, it's a very specific bias. Uh, it's a very specific uh, tendency. All right, so just my general comment about the Trump victory, just so we get this out of the way. I am horrified. Uh, I'm horrified, again, not completely unexpected. I, I somewhat, uh, you know, somewhat in some moments of dread predicted this, but I think this is uh, a really, really bad sign about America. I think this is a the beginning of a, a decline that won't be measured by the specific things that he does, but is measured by the, uh, you know, the, the state of mind, the sense of life, the approach of the, that the American people have today have today that is reflected by this election. I think this is a, a first of its kind election in in the, in the sense that it is elected the, a kind of person that we've never seen uh, hold the presidency of the United States. I think this suggests kind of again I'm giving you the punchline. This suggests uh, and I've been saying this for months and months. This suggests a a, a uh, the first step towards authoritarianism that we have seen in this country, the first real step towards the American people 
wanting an authoritarian, not that government hasn't been authoritarian, government expansion, government intervention, government involvement. It's not that other presidents haven't shown elements of authoritarianism. They have, they all have. Certainly Obama has uh, executive orders and all this other stuff. But what's unique here is we've elected a person, in my view, because he exhibits authoritarian tendencies. That is the reason he won. Because let's think about who Donald Trump is as presented in the campaign. I'm not interested in what he is in private. I'm not interested in what he is with his family. I'm not interested in what his friends say about him. I'm not interested even in what he's going to be as president. Because I do not think, I do not think that what he's going to be as president, which might be much better than what he was as a candidate, is the essential issue here. It's not what things he passes. And I've been trying to say this for months and months and months. It's not what he passes. It's not if he appeals Obamacare. It's not if he actually builds the wall or not. Although there's some issues where I think he's very it's scary and we'll see, but, and I think we need to be diligent. But it's not the, these particulars that are the issue. What we need to be concerned about now, today, right now, and I think over the next decade, is the state of mind of the American people that has brought them to the point of electing Donald Trump. Now, I know a lot of people voted for Donald Trump because they hated Hillary Clinton more. I get that. And that is a certain percentage of the population. It's a certain percentage of the Trump vote. And it's fine. I know a lot of people who did that. And I understand that. I did not do that. But I understand that. Right? I understand voting for him because you hate Hillary Clinton so much. And I understand a certain sense of, yes, the left got what it deserved. And I, I felt that election night. Yes, I hate Hillary Clinton. Isn't it great that she goes down? Isn't it great? I watched CNN on purpose because I wanted to see these leftists squirming. I wanted to see them, you know, not have, not know what to say. I was watching the New York Times. I was watching the Washington Post, which, by the way, called the election before Fox did, which was interesting. But I, I was watching all these people. And it was just fun. It was fun to watch them squirm, right? It's fun to, to, to listen to NPR and, watch the, and listen to the depressed voices and then listen to, listen to their attempts to analyze what happened. And yet, at the back of my mind, deep down, I was truly horrified by the idea that this guy is now president-elect of the United States and will actually serve as president. Right. Uh, so, uh, granted, Hillary would have been awful. Hillary's terrible, but Hillary would have been status quo. What we're getting here is a shift, a change, a fundamental change in the electorate, in its attitude, in its attitude towards America, toward what America stands for. And look, um, you know, we'll talk about the fact that many of you, I know listening, hate the left more than you hate anything else. And it, many of you, I know this because I see your emails, have bought into all kinds of conspiracy theories about the left. They're going to take over the world, George Soros and all this stuff. And, and if I have time, I'm going to address some of these things. But we need to be objective about what just happened here. What just happened. And the standard by which you evaluate all polit politics, all policy, all political decisions, all political events, is, is, is this particular event, this particular election, this particular person, is this a sign that we're moving towards more respect for individual rights? or less respect for individual rights? Is this moving us away from collectivism or towards collectivism? Away from individual liberty or towards individual liberty? And my conclusion from this election, now it would have been true with Hillary as well, but I think even worse in this case, is they're moving dramatically away from individualism. This, this uh, election is going to elevate the whole idea of collectivism and the, the, the engagement with collectivism to a level 
we've never seen before in the United States. You're already seeing it in the analysis. The analysis is all about your ethnic group, your racial group, your color of your skin, and so on, and your, and your social class. We're now breaking down people into Hispanic, working class, college educated, or not college educated. How do they vote differently than how other people vote? So, so collectivism is on the rise, individualism is in, on the decline. Again, no matter what specific policies Trump engages in, what does this tell us about the electorate? And, and I see somebody here on the chat talking about Trump as CEO. That's the scary part. Government is not a CEO. The president is not a CEO. The president's job is to protect us, not to run government like a business. Government is not a business, shouldn't be a business. It should not run like a business. Anything the government does that is a business should be privatized. All right, so my concern is that so many of you uh, uh, have, have been enamored, have been bought in to Trump, have been bought in to his agenda. Uh, some of you have accepted it because you reject Clinton even more, but many of you bought into it that you're not critical about what he really stands for, and that so many people in this country have voted, 56, 57 million people have voted for this, this creature, right? This creature, this vulgar creature. That's what Donald Trump is. The way he talks about women, anybody else would have talked about women, we would have dismissed him. It's the fact that, you know, that he can talk this way and get away with it, which appeals to so many people. Ooh, he's Bad, he's shattering constraints. He is unconstrained. Exactly a characteristic of an authoritarian. Again, let me be very clear. I do not believe that Donald Trump will be a dictator. I do not believe that Donald Trump is going to be an authoritarian, whether he wants to be or not, different question. I, I believe the system is still such that we are protected from dictatorship and authoritarianism. But as the electorate signaled, indicated, the willingness to accept a dictator, a willingness to accept an authoritarian, yes. Trump is no hero. Trump is a villain, the villain of our time. And we are going to play heavy consequences in the distant future because of this litany. Look, history unfolds slowly. It does not unfold fast. When you elect somebody, when you elect somebody, it, it, it's not that election that matters. It's what is going to be the long-term consequences of that election. And the long-term consequences here, I fear, is the rise of a populist, authoritarian-leaning population that is willing, that is willing to elect somebody to power who has no firm positions on anything. As Peter Thiel put it, the people who voted for Trump take Trump seriously but not literally. They take him seriously, but not literally. What does that mean? It means they take Trump as a figure, Trump as a leader, Trump as somebody to follow, Trump as somebody who will solve all our problems. They take that Trump seriously, but they don't take him literally. It doesn't matter what positions he take. He, they don't take him literally on trade. They don't take him literally on immigration. They don't take him literally on, uh, on any of the things that he says on Obamacare. They don't care what his specific positions are. What they care about is the individual. The that is the sign of a people accepting authoritarianism. Nobody was concerned by Donald Trump's flip-flops. Every presidential candidate in history that's flip-flopped as much as Donald Trump has suffered the consequences of it. No consequence of Trump. Nothing. It proposes things that are ridiculous and undoable. Mexican government is going to pay for the wall. Does anybody ask him how? Don't worry. I'm taking care of it. I got it. You don't have to worry about anything. I'm going to do it. But give us, give us a clue. How are you going to achieve this? How is this going to be successful? How is it going to happen? Blank. Nothing. Nothing. Right? So,
have a trade deal with China. We do not have a trade deal with China. I'm going to. Any kind of detail. Forget about details. We don't need details. It's about Donald Trump and making America great again. That's what it's about. Nothing else matters. It's not about. It's not about facts. It's not about reality. It's not about what's doable. It's about Donald Trump. All right, so um, it looks like uh, Facebook Live keeps freezing up. So uh, we'll continue the experiment. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how this will work. It, it's still running, uh, but uh, you know we'll have to figure out. I have to figure out how to get a better internet connection up in my office. Uh, I'll have to get a router, a special router, just for the camera up here. Uh, everything else, everything else, I've wired on wired internet. Anyway, so let's let's think about the Donald Trump campaign in 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 what he what did he what did he present to the American people as is an argument is his argument well he started off I mean he's very clever it's very clever how he did this he starts off with how bad things are America's in decline America's dark crime is everywhere uh, we, we, we're being, you know, murder rates are going through the roof, uh, primarily by illegal immigrants, by the way. Our borders are completely open, completely open. We're being flooded by immigrants, just like w w happened in Europe where, you know, Muslims just flooded across the border. Supposedly the same thing is happening in the United States. Again, no facts, no evidence. We're f being flooded by illegal immigrants who are committing amazing numbers of crimes. Amazing numbers of crimes. The, 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 we, are, we are suffering left and right. No solutions. No presentation of solutions. I mean, I thought that his speech at the Republican National Convention was one of the most horrific speeches I've ever heard. It was so dark, so negative, so false, full of lies and misinformation and non-facts. I did not say mass migration into Europe was not happening and it wasn't a bad thing. That's not what I said. What I said was there is no mass migration happening in the United States. There is no flooding of the U.S. borders. So, yeah, we, we, we've got some alt-right people on my chat that are pissing me off. But, uh, and by the way, uh, whoever said that I woke up on the wrong side of the bed, not at all. I'm actually uh, actually not not on the wrong side of the bed at all, but actually pissed off more than anything else by the fact that so many people, so many people who call themselves objectivists, who call themselves free markets, can't see through what this election is really about. So uh, the whole pitch is our country is finished. Our country is dead. Our standard of living has declined, which is just not true. It's just not true. As bad as things are in this country, even those white working class people in Ohio and in Wisconsin and in Florida, even their standard of living has gone up. All of them are using iPhones. All of them are, 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 are living, a, you know, much better lives. Much better lives than they did 30 years ago. This mythology which I deal with with Don Watkins in our book, Equal is Unfair. This mythology that the standard of living in America has declined dramatically. We are so much poorer today than we were 30, 40 years ago. The 70s are the shock. This is, this is leftist rhetoric. This is, this is exactly the rhetoric of Bernie Sanders. And Donald Trump picked up on it in, in spades. This is indeed... I think exactly what happened, that many of the Bernie Sanders, many Bernie Sanders voters uh, voted for Donald Trump. I mean, that's, and that's what the, I think Democrats are recognizing as well. And I think what you're going to see in a Democratic Party is a significant rise in, uh, in the, the, the Bernie Sanders wing of the Democratic Party because they realize that, that it's their voters 
they're people who voted for Donald Trump. It is Bernie Sanders' people who voted for Bernie Trump, particularly the older ones. I think young people either didn't vote or voted for Hillary. But the older generation, the more socialist generation of working class Americans who want protectionism, who want their jobs protected, who want so-called higher wages, who are convinced that inequality is destroying the world, they voted for Donald Trump. So read Equal is Unfair. Read the chapter about the fact that our standard of living is so much higher today. There's so many good things happening in America. And I know I, it, it, it's funny because every time, every time I talk about Silicon Valley and how phenomenal Silicon Valley is and how I believe Silicon Valley represents all the best in America, not from a political perspective, not from a explicitly political ideological perspective, but because of the productiveness, because of the innovation, because of entrepreneurship, that's what America is. America's business. America's building. America's creating. Think of Atlas Shrugged. What place on the planet represents Atlas Shrugged more than Silicon Valley? And yet, blank out on all of that. Oh no, the world is going to hell. Life is horrible in America. America is in massive decline. And there's elements of truth to all that. That's why it's tenable. That's why it's tenable, right? America's in massive decline. Why is it in massive decline, you ask? Why is it in massive? Why are all these horrible things happening to us? And this is where, again, so the first step of a, an authoritarian-like figure is to tell you how everything is falling apart, how horrible the world is. Step two. Why is it falling apart? Well, it's not your fault. It's none of our fault. It's not any, it's not ideas. Ideas don't change the world. Whose fault is it? Well, it, 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 it's other people's fault. It's the Mexicans' fault. It's free traders' fault. It's the Japanese and the Chinese' fault. It's the media's fault. It's the media's fault, right? The mainstream media, the corruption of the mainstream media. I want to talk about the media afterwards because the, the attacks on the media are very, very, very dangerous. And many of you are part of these attacks and you got to watch what you do. Uh, it's the media. It's the elites. It's the elites. It's the establishment. It's somebody else. It's not the American people. God forbid. No, the American people are perfect. It's all these people are screwing you. All these people are screwing you. So, we scapegoat. So, part one, America is a dark, dark, scary place. Why is it scary? Because of Mexicans and Chinese and Muslims and people. And again, the elements of truth to all this, yes, you know, crime has been on the rise the last year. Exploits that, yes, policemen have been shot. That's a bad thing. Yes, there's illegal immigration. Yes, some people, their wages have been stagnant. You know, all, yeah, there's elements of truth to all of them. But none of them are the essential. None of them are the essential. It's not the media destroying this country. It's our intellectuals. It's our universities. Why are they destroying the country? Because they have bad ideas. And if you want to combat them, how are you going to do it? With good ideas. With good ideas. Mexicans are not the guilty. Trade is not the guilty. NAFTA is not the guilty. And the media is not the guilty. The elites. What are the elites? The elites, by the way, are often on the left and on the right described as the 1%. Are they the guilty, really? Really? Silicon Valley, in spite of all, in spite of its political leftism, is holding this country, pulling this country forward. You want to blame them? Really? It's their fault? Yes, the political elites are corrupt, but much more importantly, it's the intellectual elites. And why are they corrupt? Because of ideas. And what do you propose in terms of alternative ideas? Blank. Nothing. I have nothing to propose. It's their fault. We don't need to change ideas, quite the contrary. We're going to double up on their ideas. We're going to double up on their collectivism. We're going to double up on their statism. 
I'm going to be the CEO because the state is a venture that I'm going to run. We're going to double up on all the th bad things that have caused this problem. Yes, trade is bad. You know why trade is bad? Because we have too many tariffs. Trade is bad because we limit too much trade. The TPP is bad because it's not free trade enough. But that's not Donald Trump's position. NAFTA's bad because we should just have no tariffs between the U.S. and Mexico. And American companies should be able to go into Mexico and open up shop there if they want. But you remember what Donald Trump said about that? He was going to have a special tax for companies who left the country. Now, how is that consistent? Any of you out there who support Donald Trump and his ideas, how is that consistent with individual rights? How is that consistent with freedom? How is that consistent with capitalism or free markets? The idea that if an American company wants to move to Mexico, you're going to penalize them. Or if they want to buy an Irish company, if you want to buy an Irish company and move to Ireland and move your headquarters to Ireland to minimize taxes, which is, ta which is a, which is a uh, what do you call it, a shareholder maximizing position, which is a pro-capitalist position. You know, how, how, how do you, Donald Trump wants to penalize that. How do you defend that? I mean, it doesn't it strike you that if he thinks that way about American companies moving their businesses, trying to maximize shareholder wealth, trying to make more money, that if he thinks that, that about it, that he has a real problem. I'm not saying Donald Trump should be an objectivist. I don't measure anybody by him being an objectivist. But there's a certain sense in which that, plus his immigration position, plus his trade position, reflects on a certain mentality that is so anti-capitalist, so anti-individualist, so anti-American. I do not know of a more anti-American president. And I used to say this about, about Obama, but now I say this about Donald Trump. In principle, in his principled you know, approach to the world than Donald Trump. Um, okay, so he's, he, 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 we're all going to die. It's all their fault. It's the fault of the other. Um, and then, of course, the solution is to shield us from the other, to protect us from the other. How are we going to do that? Well, we might even consider silencing. We might even consider silencing some of them, the media. So one of the most horrific things he said was the idea of going after Amazon because he was being criticized by the Washington Post. I don't know. A statement like that, just even in a half joke by a presidential candidate, in my view, disqualifies that candidate. Just even as a half joke. Just the fact that he could say that and you guys are cheering on. Scares the bejesus out of me. Okay. So we're going to protect you by, you know, reconfiguring the media, by putting the media in its place. Right? Really? This is the job of the president? By closing off the borders. God forbid we have more immigrants because immigrants, all the problems we have today are caused by immigrants. The violence, the the low wages, all of this stuff is caused by immigrants. Nonsense, but nobody, nobody, nobody wants to deal with facts. God forbid we talk about facts. So we're going to shield you, we're going to protect you from those immigrants. And, and all those people outside, you know, the Japanese, the Koreans, the Mexicans, everybody else who trades with us, oh, and is taking our jobs. Taking our jobs. Then we're going to shield you from them as well. We're going to erect walls, trade barriers to keep them away from us. Right? So we're going to shield you from all those evil, threatening monsters that are out there to get you. And that's the job of government is to shield you, to protect you. Right? How are we going to do this? Oh, don't worry about the details. Don't worry about facts. Don't worry about details. Don't worry about facts. We're going to do it. We're going to take care of it. And this is where the authoritarianism really comes in, right? Don't worry about the details of the facts. Trust me. Trust in me. Isn't it that song, Trust in Me? Trust me. I'll take care of it. Ah. <sighs>
I don't know. And, and, and some of you are still defending him. Some of you are still defending him. Yeah. And I know. Uh, anyway. Um, so these are, you know, this is what we elected. Right? Flip-flops, undoables, no details, trust me. Unconstrained by anything. This is what people really liked. He's unconstrained. They love that fact that the the, P, the lack of PC came across in that he's going to clean the swamp. Well, I agree that Washington's a swamp. I hate Washington, D.C. How are you going to clean it? But by the way, I found it fascinating that when you look at this transition team, it's all Washington insiders. All Washington insiders. And at the heart of the, at the, heart of the transition team is the Heritage uh, Foundation. Heritage, the pro-religion, pro-religion, uh, uh, pro-conservative, pro-Romney-care, heritage uh, devised Romney care. Um, they are at the heart of the whole transition team. If you look at the members of the transition team, all insiders, many of them lobbyists. And by the way, if you guys think Rudy Giuliani is a good guy, really? Rudy Giuliani is exactly the kind of guy we should be very, very, very afraid of. <laughs> yeah, right? Rudy Giuliani is the guy who went after Mike Milken. Rudy Giuliani is the guy who used to handcuff people and invite the press when he arrested them. Rudy Giuliani, Rudy Giuliani is the guy who used his attack on Wall Street in order to create a political career, who taught, uh, what's his name, uh, Spitzer, everything that he knows about using the Attorney General's position in order to create a political, in order to create a political career. Rudy Giuliani cleaned up New York, absolutely, by using fascist techniques, by violating property rights, left and right. So Rudy is no hero. Rudy is exactly the kind of authoritarian we should be worried about. I have been railing about Rudy Giuliani since the 1980s. I hate the guy for what the injustice he did to one of the greatest entrepreneurs, one of the greatest business leaders, one of the greatest financiers in history, what he did to, to, uh, to Mike Milken. And of course, we saw with Bridgegate, you know, what, what, uh, what the, our, our uh, you know, New Jersey governor, uh, 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 Trump's other fan, other big pal, uh, you know, what kind, of, what kind of government he runs, where, where you penalize people you don't like by victimizing their constituencies. So he's going to clean up the swamp. Is he? Really? How's he going to do that? How's he going to do that? How's he going to clean up the swamp when he has been part of the swamp his entire career? Where he has been hand in hand with the governing elite from the beginning? He's not, he, he said, he said, I'm not, I'm not constrained by previous statements. Previous things that I said, eh, that doesn't mean anything. We're going we're gonna to just go by, by, by what, what we think is going to work in the moment. He's not constrained by previous statements because he's unconstrained by anything. That's what we want in authoritarian, right? We want in a, somebody who's going to lead through his, you know, personality alone. He wouldn't, he said he wouldn't necessarily accept the results of the election. Now he's complaining about demonstrations who are not accepting the results of the, of the election. Nobody seems to think that's a problem. Nobody seems to think that maybe his saying over and over and over and over again that he would not accept the results of the election is not why partially there are demonstrations right now. Again, I'm not measuring him versus an objectivist. But I would say on all of these things, on all of these things, I don't know any presidential candidate who's been worse, any president, now he's, a, he's president-elect, who's been worse. Right? Do you remember that he said, do you remember that he said at some point in the campaign that he, this, this represents everything you need to know about the people who voted for Donald Trump and his understanding of the people who voted for, Don, for him. He said that he could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot someone and people would still vote for him. Now think about that. That means that he's saying that his voters are so enamored with him, so focused just on his personality, his ability to get stuff done, 
that even if he was a murderer and everybody knew he was a murderer, that people would still vote for him. Right? All right. So this is where we are. This is who we've got. This is, uh, this is uh, the person that we've elected president. He will be president. We have to accept it now. And I think the focus needs to be on what we need to do. How do we minimize, how do we minimize the damage that Donald Trump has done, how do, uh, is going to do? How do we minimize the, it's not so much that Donald Trump has done. I'd say it differently. How do we minimize the damage that has been done to the electorate that would vote for Donald Trump. So my focus is, and your focus should be, not on Donald Trump, but our focus should be on the people who voted for him. What do we have to do so that this doesn't happen again? What do we have to do to change the orientation of the American people away from authoritarianism, away from this idea that one man can solve all the problems, that America is in darkness and the solution to all our problems is building walls, walls around trade, walls around our country, walls around the media, walls around the so-called bad people. Yeah, for those of you who wonder, you know, uh, would I be this uh, uh, angry if Hillary Clinton had won? My answer is no, I would not. No, no. Hillary Clinton would have suggested to me that the electorate has rejected authoritarianism and they voted for the standard, corrupt, stupid, leftist politician that Hillary Clinton is. And we would have dealt with another four years of the status quo. And it, you know, but, but what Donald Trump selected is a seismic shift in my view. Now, again, Donald Trump might turn out in his specific policies to be much, much better than anybody else. And we'll talk, I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Doesn't change the fact. Doesn't change the fact. I'm not going to deal with the concretes. Because the concretes here, I mean, Liran, you're the guy who claims to know how to think. Give me a break. Give me a break. Um, he might concretely do good things. But the question is, what does this election tell us about the American people? What does this election tell us about the future of America? Not in one year, not in five years, but in 10 or 20 years. Where are we heading? This is, this is the first small step towards authoritarianism. Not Obama, not Judge Bush, not all the rest, but this is the fall, first false step. You have to be able to think conceptually about this. If you just focus, and I've been saying this for months, if you just focus on a list of concrete items, who gets the check marks, that is not the right approach to thinking. It's not the right approach to evaluating. One has to look at the fundamentals. One has to look at what one can induce from the character, the language, the ideas of the person who won that motivated the people to vote for him. That is what objectivism is. All right. So, in order to understand, uh, in order to understand what we need to do, I think we have to first understand why we're in the place that we are. Why are we where we are today? Uh, how did we get here? How did, we, how did the American people get to the point, get to the point, of electing this guy? What are, what are the things that have happened in America to our people that have brought us to this point? All right. Uh, so I'm going to go over some of those, and then I'm going to talk about some of the promises he's made, Obamacare, regulations, the wall, the trade, and what I think is actually going to happen and what I think will actually get done. Uh, what I find, uh, you know, uh, uh, let me just note, for those of you who think I've been uh, talking about abstractions and detached from reality, everything I've given you, American darkness, uh, that's all concrete. Scapegoating, all concrete. It's, it, the, the protectionism, all examples, all concrete. What people say about him, his flip-flops, 
his, uh, his uh, completely unconstrained ideas about everything, all concretes, all particulars, all concrete particulars. And yet, you want to avoid facts, you want to avoid reality, you are blinded, you are blinded by, and this is exactly what authoritarianism does to you, you are blinded by, oh, you know, but he said this thing out of context that sounded like, sounded right. Oh, but he gets stuff done. Yeah, that's exactly what authoritarians do. That's exactly what authoritarians do. All right. Um, let's talk about the causes. But before I do that, I'm going to take a short break. Sorry, uh, you guys on uh, Facebook Live, you don't get to hear the commercials. Really feel sorry for you. All right, here we go. Can you hear me also? I'm going to take this a bit. Can you? Okay. Wait back. All right, we're back. And uh, I see Facebook Live is still working. Uh, probably some technical problems. It's freezing once in a while. So we're going to improve it. This was a test first time, but hopefully in the future we'll get a whole bunch of other people. You know, there are about 
Uh, right now, there are over 100 uh, people watching it live. So, uh, you know, it, was, it reached 3,000 people. We'll build an audience slowly. We'll uh, expand what we do. And uh, now you can exactly, somebody on the chat said, now you can find out what I do in the commercials. I eat pecans and drink coffee. And you can see that. I drink coffee while I talk too. All right. Uh, now, the only thing is if you watch and listen on Blog Talk, all my statistics get screwed up. So, but so be it. That's fine. We're going to blow up all these statistics anyway. Uh, we're going to turn the show uh, you know, we're going to take it from right now. We get about uh, we're getting about 55,000 downloads uh, a month or every 30 days, which is about two and a half times to three times what it was a year ago. Um, but we need to get this up to half a million downloads in uh, 30 days or, or a million downloads in 30 days. And, and as usual, I'm asking for your help to make this happen. And uh, maybe this Facebook Live is part of the strategy to get more people millions of people ultimately to be listening to the show. Although, you know, I'm, I'm getting a lot of hate stuff here about my position on, uh, on Trump. So how did, uh, so, so, so let's, <laughs> let's talk about how we got here. And uh, I, I have a feeling my, my uh, listenership is going to drop because uh, God forbid I should say anything negative about Trump. So uh, it, it, never mind say that Trump in fundamental terms, in essential terms, is worse than his election is a worse thing than any previous election, but which is what I've been saying. Let's talk about the causes. How did we get here? What is it? What is it that has brought us to the situation where the American people, freedom loving, individualistic American sense of life, for somebody like Donald Trump. And I think we have to start about, I don't know, uh, I, I was listening today on the radio on NPR and somebody make this point, and I think he's absolutely right. When the New York Times spends more columns on gender issues than on economic issues, on the issues that most Americans care about. You might have a problem. Not am I against dealing with these gender issues. I think many of them are important. But just the amount of time and the tone and the way it's expressed and the way it's discussed, it leaves so many American people felt detached completely. When the left constantly talks about racial identity, gender identity, identity in the context of, in the context of groups in the context of the collective. Ooh, I'm getting somebody on the chat saying, Yvonne, please leave Trump alone. That man has not harmed, any, harmed on you. Yes, he has. He just became president. I can't think of things that have harmed me more, that are harming me more and will be harming me more. He is a reflection of the American people and it scares me. Okay. Um, of the way the American people are today. So part of this is a backlash, a backlash. Again, not just the political correctness of the left, but the whole agenda of the left. Black Lives Matter. Yeah, Black Lives Matter has a legitimate, legitimate base, a legitimate base. But then they spout all this Marxist nonsense and they accuse all white people of being racist. And people are going, wait a minute, wait a minute. Most of the cops, 90% of the cops I know, good people. Stop vilifying all cops. Stop encouraging cop shootings. And stop advocating for this Marxist nonsense. That's anti-American. And this is what, this is what, so much of the, so much of our media, so much of our elites, so much of these are focused on. So there's an enormous backlash against the subjectivism, the moral relativism, the politically correctness, the Marxism, the, the, the vilification of America, the vilification of Americanism, the vilification of Americans. There's a huge backlash against all of that. So I think a lot of this is a backlash against the left. 
But the backlash against the left only works. It only, it only works because the right has no answers to all the claims of the left. The right, the right doesn't actually present a viable, real, intellectual alternative. And that's what's missing. So you've got a left that's wacky. I mean, when people in America hear about safe spaces, when people in America hear about these snowflake students and all the stuff that they study in school, they rebel. They rebel positively. This is a good thing that they're rebelling. But then what happens is the right gives them nothing. The right gives them the same old religious, nonsensical platitudes that they always have. And then when they get into power, they do nothing. They promise all these things, but nothing changes. Nothing changes. And then you've got this left that does all these, and advocates for all these horrible things. And then what's the right? The right is Fox News. No new ideas and reflects no, no intellectual combat to what is, uh, you know, no intellectual answer to what the left has raised. It's empty. It's hollow. It's shallow. And indeed, at the end of the day, it is saying, and it's not surprising in my view that Fox News overwhelmingly went for uh, Donald Trump, even during the primaries, people like Hannity, because they were, they were eager to, they have no answers. They don't know how to deal with the left. They don't know how to deal with the problems this country's facing. They don't know how to talk to the American people intelligently about shrinking the size of government, about entitlements, about regulations. They have no idea how to do it. So they're much better off now. They're much better off. So what, what, what they actually do is they say, oh, here's a guy who can fix it because he's a businessman. So we're going to revert, we're going to revert to, um, oops, sorry, I'm being distracted by the fact that I don't think the Facebook thing is, uh, is working. I'm not sure why. Um, I'm not sure why it's not working. Yeah, I can't. If it is working, if you guys are actually seeing a picture, because I'm, I'm looking at my Facebook and I can't see anything. Now, I see. It's telling me the Internet is slow, but there's no reason for the Internet to be slow. So, um, anyway, we're going to keep going under the assumption that uh, Facebook Live will take care of itself, right? All right, it's working, they say. It's working fine, I'm told. All right. So um, the right has no answer to the left, except religion. Now, what does religion train us to do? What does religion at the end of the day demand that we do? Think? Evaluate? Study? No. Religion trains us epistemologically to follow orders. Religion fundamentally... fundamentally is authoritarian it fundamentally is authoritarian so religion demands that we give up our minds well surprise surprise the right has pounded away at religion has said that the problem in America is not enough religion has said that the problem in America is you know too much secularism and secularism is represented by the left. There is no secular right. So, so most people look at the left, that's secularism. I don't want to be that. And they look at the right and they say, oh, I'm religious. And, what, and, and, and religion is more important, so I need to become more religious. And at the end of the day, all of that is doing is making the American people, making the American people more cynical, more skeptical, more emotional, less and less and less intellectual and more open to authoritarianism. That's what religion does 
That's what unthinking does. Now, I lost to say that there's a role here for the internet, which is which is interesting. And I, you know, the, the internet's an amazing tool, and it's an amazing tool to communicate. And everybody gets to communicate. There's no filtering on the internet. So you can find anything from anybody. It's very hard to tell what is right and what is wrong, what is true and what is false. Right? And the internet is filled with all kinds of conspiracy theories and crazy ideas and, and explanations for things. And also the algorithms on the internet, particularly on Facebook and Twitter and places like that, are such that they encourage you to keep seeing the same stuff over and over again. They encourage you to keep seeing more and more of the same material. Because you keep seeing, you keep reinforcing the same messages. If you click on a link from a particular perspective, you're going to get more stuff on that perspective. That's what Google does. That's what Facebook does. That's what Twitter does. So they create these echo chambers where all we hear is reinforcement of the ideas we already believe in, including the, 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 the wacky stuff when, when the wacky stuff is relevant. Right. So technology plays a role here. And I've seen more people, more people who, are, who I think are basically good people, buy into conspiracy theories, buy into crazy ideas in this last few years than ever before. Why? Because they read it on the internet, they read a story, it gets reinforced by other stories, and because we don't trust the mainstream media, there's no forum, there's no place in which to get a counter to the nonsense, to the nonsense that you uh, that, that 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 you get from these conspiracy theories, there's no place where you can get sanity except on the Iran book show. That's why you should listen. So what you get is more and more and more and more of this, you know, of this these ideas, and and I see this now. I get I get so many. Emails and so many people telling me about this vast left-wing conspiracy. It starts with George Soros, and I'm going to do a whole show on George Soros. It starts with George Soros, who is the devil, and who is connected and funds and is responsible intellectually and through everything else for everything the left does. And basically wants to take over the world and establish world government run by the United Nations. Uh, now, George Soros is a bad man. George Soros is philosophically corrupt. George Soros is... Um, George Soros is a... Uh, you know, he funds all these programs. He funds all these things. It's all true. But is George Soros running a vast left-wing conspiracy to bring about world government? No. No. He's not able to do that. He's not competent enough to do that. And he's just, he, 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 that's not what he's doing. It's not what he's doing. Uh, but I'll do a whole show on George Soros. But people are so terrified of this guy. Now, what's amazing to me, what's amazing to me, is if you shift, is if you shift to listen and read left-wing media. So the, 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 the uh, what do you call it? The social justice warriors. That everything they, that, that the right-wing alt-right says about George Soros, the other guys say about the Koch brothers. It's a vast right-wing conspiracy. And everything that you say about George Soros is said about the Koch brothers. Exactly the same stuff. And I know a little bit about the vast right-wing conspiracy because I guess I'm part of it. You know, full disclosure, I get money to the Koch Foundation. I've actually met one of the Koch brothers. Oh, my God. And it's about as much of a conspiracy as they have on the left. There's some very wealthy people who believe in certain ideas and they fund a lot of programs. And yes, there's even some coordination that goes on. But there's no conspiracy here, left or right. 
And yet, if all we read are the same books by the same authors over and over again, it's scary. It's scary. Oh my God, the world is being taken over. The world is being taken over. And the world is being taken over by bad ideas. I have to remind you, some of you are new, but at least the ones who are consider themselves objectivists, I have to remind you that Ayn Rand's view of history is that ideas shape history. Not conspiracies, not rich guys, not money. Ideas. Hey, by the way, I'm not saying the Koch brothers are alt-right. I'm saying the left views the Koch brothers as alt-right. Oh my God, I say stuff and the way it's interpreted on the chat, it scares the bejesus out of me. You know, somebody on the chat tell me I didn't say or imply that the Koch brothers are alt-right. No, the left views them as such. The cup, the, the, the coctopus. View Soros. That was my point. It's that the same kind of silly thinking, or silly thinking is called non thinking, is going on on both sides. So, all this stuff, the reinforcement of, 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 uh, of conspiracy theories, the echo chambers, that we only hear news from one place, we only hear one side of stories, we don't listen to the other side, we don't know people from the other side. This is why I listen always to NPR. And I have to admit, I enjoy NPR. I find NPR much better news source than anybody else that I, t that I listen to. I don't, I don't, I don't watch, I don't, I, I once in a while will go to Drudge, I once in a while will dabble in the right wing. I watch Fox once in a while, though I hate, I hate television news of all forms. Um, but I, I'll read, you know, I'll read the New York Times, I'll read the Washington Post, and I'll read the, 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 uh, the Wall Street Journal, and I'll read the fringe stuff, left and right. But m most people only read one side of it. Now, if you add into this mix of a disgust with the left, which is what Leonard Peikoff has been saying all along in DIM, that it will be disgust with a D2 that leads to authoritarianism. It's absolutely right. Disgust with the left the disintegration, the nihilism. Right. So that's on one side. And then on the other side, on the other side, you've got the right that is advocating religion. And when it's not advocating religion, it's not advocating anything meaningful. No ideas to counter the left. And the echo chamber. And you add into all of that our lousy, pathetic educational system. is the election of Donald Trump. And that means that what we need to do today what we need to fight is the philosophy of the left and the religion of the right. What we need today is a secular right-wing capitalist so a secular capitalist movement that is pro-free speech. One of the reasons I am so excited or, or, or so uh, enthused about, um, what's his name, <laughs> Dave Rubin, is because I think he represents a secular, potentially capitalist, we're, we're, we're heading in that direction, but pro-free speech movement. Right? Now let me, just, let, let, let me just say something about free speech before I get back to this. Free speech is one of the, Ayn Rand identified this, and I think it's, it, it, it makes sense to anybody who thinks about it. It's one of the most important issues of, in any intellectual, if you believe in intellectual change. History of what will shape the future. Then what we need is free speech. What we have to have is free speech. Without free speech, we are lost. We're finished. It's a disaster. And if we're going to watch Donald Trump on anything, it's his attack on the media. It's his uh, threatening the media. I gave you the example of the Washington Post before, but just 
he also uh, said something about uh, expanding libel laws so they could silence people. That attack, that hostility to the media, that is the most dangerous thing we face. I am willing to defend the mainstream media that all of you vilify so much. Because in defending them, I'm going to defend free speech. And because I actually think a lot of the mainstream media, the garbage in the New York Times is better than the garbage a lot of you are reading from the so-called alt-right or alt-left. And reading the New York Times once in a while gives you a certain perspective on what's going on in the world that you will not get anywhere else. Yeah, I know. I've been accused of being in the MSNBC bubble. So, the idea, the idea that, that we should limit the mainstream media, that we should be attacking the media, that we should be attacking expressions of free speech, expressions of uh, attempts of people, biased as they may be, to deliver the news, to deliver information, is horrifying. And it's something that we need to be super, super, super vigilant. I don't care if the newspapers fact check or not. I mean, I do care. But they have a right to free speech, whether they fact check or not. There's no special category where newspapers have to be right in order to get free speech. Any more than you have to be right in order to, for the First Amendment to protect your speech. Libel laws have a place, a place which exists today. We have libel laws in America. We need stronger libel laws to protect us from speech that the president doesn't like. I can't think of anything more dangerous than that. I can't think of anything more dangerous than that. So, free speech, we have to fight for it. And if that means, and I'm saying this here, if that means defending NPR, I'm on the front line. As I said, I listen to NPR every day when I'm home, and I, I enjoy it. I enjoy it. And uh, if you don't believe, if you don't believe that uh, free speech is the most essential uh, uh, right that must be defended right now, then this is why we're losing. This is why we're losing. All right. So we need a secular right. We need a secular right movement. And, and I'm using right here. I hate using right. We need a secular pro-free markets movement that defends as a primary free speech. Again, this is why I love Dave Rubin so much because he is such a defender of free speech and he's secular and we're slowly moving him in the right direction when it comes to economics. And we need this movement to be able to have the right arguments against the left and the right arguments against religion. And to do that, that movement needs Ayn Rand. And we need to convince that movement that they need Ayn Rand. We need to convince the Dave Rubens of the world that Ayn Rand is essential. And then we need to fight. We need to fight. Fight every sign of authoritarianism. Fight every sign of attacking free speech. I mean, what if President, Ob uh, President uh, uh, Trump through executive order, abolishes Obamacare. What if he finds a way to get around Congress to launch a war that we all like? What if he does stuff that we all think is good, but he does it in an authoritarian way? We're going to have to fight against it. We're going to have to fight against it, just like we fought against Obama doing authoritarian things for, wrong, for the wrong goal. We have to fight Trump when he does good things in a wrong way. Our system of government, the idea of checks and balances, the idea of separation of powers, 
that has to stand. The idea of free speech has to stand. Even if, quote, what he's trying to do is good, like an Obamacare. Well, you know, and, and it, let me just concede, because people, people, people here, uh, people here suggesting, let me just concede um, that he might do some good things. He might do some good things. His energy policy is probably going to be very good. The fact that he's not a global warming nut is very good. He's talking about abolishing and replacing Obamacare, although what he replaces it with might be worse than Obamacare in the long run. But who knows, right? He's talking about deregulation. I'll believe it when I see it, but he's talking about it. Right? So he, I, I agree. He's going to do some good things, potentially. But you don't evaluate. You don't revalue Pinochet just be, by just the fact that he brought more economic freedom to Chile. You also have to consider the fact that he murdered thousands of people. You also have to consider the fact that he was an authoritarian, that he was a dictator, that freedom in Chile disappeared, that there was no free speech. Now, he gets credit for walking away from that in the end and reinstituting elections and freedoms in Chile. But you can't evaluate his, his period just by the fact that he brought capitalism to Chile. So, yeah, he's going to do some good things. Uh, probably. Maybe. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully. Hopefully. The, 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 the bright spot of all this disaster stuff is going to be things like his energy policy, things like some deregulation, things like some issues like that. All right. I got a couple of calls. I'm going to, I'm going to at the risk of people yelling at me, I'm going to take these two calls. One of them has been waiting uh, forever, I think. I think this is. All right. Hi, you're on the wrong book show. Who's this? Hey, Jennifer. I'm good. How about you? In spite of how angry I sound, I'm, I'm doing pretty well. Yeah, so unfortunately on, on Facebook Live, you can't hear the call. I know that. I warned you guys at the beginning of the show, those of you who listened, you can't hear the call. We don't have the sound uh, uh, hooked into Facebook Live. We're slowly, we'll, we'll get there. Um, but uh, basically, it's the it was upper management that came in and said, uh, started talking about it, and, and they wouldn't even listen to what you said. Now, that's my experience with people who supported Trump. That was my experience in Chicago a couple of weeks ago. That's my experience on the chat here. Um, people are not interested in facts. They're not interested in evidence. This is pure emotion. And you can tell by how angry and, and how obnoxious they get when you try to raise any one of these issues. And uh, it, it, it pu it's pure emotion. It's, it's, emotion is what drives. It's what's driving this. And, and it's, it's really, you know, it's really scary. It, it really is scary. All right. Thanks for calling. Really appreciate it. I'm going to try to get two more calls in uh, and uh, say, you know, maybe say a few positive things. Uh, hi, you're on the wrong book show. Who's this? Hey, Debbie. Good. Well, and you're calling from one of my favorite places on the planet, which I get ridiculed for constantly. She's calling from Silicon Valley for those of you on Facebook Live. What's up? I do, because you're, you're part of this, you're part of the elite 
that is oppressing this country. You're part of the uh, leftist uh, elite that is destroying America. And, and you like immigrants. And, and you like immigrants. How bad is that? Yeah, I know. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, and even Zuckerberg, you, can, you know, he might be a lefty, but you know what? He's created a, a fantastic product, which is allowing me to stream the radio show live and will allow over time thousands, if not millions of people to be exposed to better ideas. So go Zuckerberg. I'm going to cut you off. I hate to cut you off because this is great stuff. And I want you to call back. I want to do a show on Silicon Valley on why I think Silicon Valley is, is the most important place in America. And if we lose Silicon Valley, we lose the culture. Because I agree with you completely. And, and, and I'm going to, thanks for calling. Really appreciate it. Uh, but I am running out of time. Let, let me just completely agree. Because there's a lot of great things happening in the world. There's a lot of great things happening in our culture and a lot of those great things are happening in Silicon Valley. There is a culture of work ethic. There's a culture of meritocracy. There's a culture of achievement. There's a culture of, of, of understanding, of curiosity, of scientific inquiry, of reason that happens over there. And by vilifying that culture, we are vilifying what America really is. And why is that culture turning away from the so-called right? Why is that culture anti the Republican Party? Because that culture won't vote for somebody who doesn't believe in evolution. They won't vote for a party who rejects evolution. So they won't vote Republican. And they shouldn't vote Republican. And this is, again, my call for a secular pro-free market movement. Emphasis on secular. Now, I don't have time today to talk about the awful Wall Street Journal article that was published uh, a few days ago. I'll have to pick that up next week. But that's exactly what we don't need. We don't need more association of Ayn Rand with God. I mean, not God as Ayn Rand, but, you know, the, the idea that it's okay to be religious and love Ayn Rand at the same time. Now, I have no problem, and I, and I, and I love the fact that a lot of religious people like Ayn Rand. But that's not the ideal, that's not the model, that's not what we're striving for. We need, we need a secular world. We need a world in which it rejects the whole idea of religion, that rejects the idea of faith. If you accept faith and you accept Ayn Rand, you're a better person than if you accept faith and reject Ayn Rand. But you're still not where you need to be. What we really need, again, I will say, is a secular, pro-free speech, pro-free market movement. And I actually put free speech before free market because I think it's more important right now. And Dave, if you ever listen to the show, 
This is a shout out to you. Hi, Yondi One Book Show. Who's this? Hey, Chris, how's it going? I was just in Phoenix. I just spoke in Phoenix two days ago. All right, all right. So that Chris, cool. Glad you're calling in. Yep. No, absolutely. That's exactly, it's a lot of what I've been trying to say today is exactly that. But I think, I think it's deeper. And this is what scared me. Thanks for the call, Chris. And it was good, good having lunch and good seeing you at the Federal Society in, uh, in Phoenix. And thanks for organizing that event, helping organize that event. But um, I, I think that it's deeper than that. It's not just that they feel good about rejecting it. It's that they have bought into the idea, too many American people have bought into the idea, not everybody voted for Trump, but too many people, that the way to fix this is not an intellectual battle of ideas that we need to engage in, that's going to take decades, but that we need a strong man. We need somebody who says, don't worry, I got this. I'm going to take care of it. I know how to do this. Um, and that, I think, is what fundamentally is scary about about, again, more about the people than about Trump, because I don't think Trump could get away with it. I don't think Trump, I, I, because I actually think the fact that the Republicans won the House and Senate is not a bad thing, because I think, the, 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 particularly at the House, but also in the Senate, there are better Republicans than Donald Trump, who won't let him do the really, really stupid things. At least I hope not. Uh, I, I, you know, as much as I, I, worry about, I worry about Paul Ryan, but, but I think there are people who are going to be able to stand up for Trump and say no. And I, and I think he doesn't believe in anything very strongly. It's not that he believes in a wall or he believes in any of these things. I, I don't think he believes in anything. So I think people will be able to talk him off the ledge when it comes to really, 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 really stupid things. Okay, so we will see. Okay, we got one last call. And really, this is the last call. Hi, you're on the Iran Book Show. Who's this? Hey, Ben from New York. Yep. Okay, well, let, let me try, let me, I mean, yes and no, but let me try to address that. Thanks for calling. I didn't catch you up just because I've got like seven minutes to end the show. Um, so are there good things that we can look forward to that will help? Now, the big picture is, the, the answer I think, unfortunately, is no, because, um, because the specifics don't matter. It's not, the, the specific things that he does doesn't matter. It's how he does them and, and, uh, and how people interpret the reason that he does it. But saying that, he is going to probably going to try to reform Obamacare. And there's a chance because there are better people um, who are advising him that they might do a pretty good job with Obamacare. I mean, Paul Ryan has some pretty good ideas on what to do about health care, even about what to do about Medicare and about what to do about a lot of the entitlement programs. Not objectivist solutions, but pretty good solutions. Solutions that will move us towards more freedom, that will move us towards, uh, you know, towards uh, greater liberty slowly. So there are things that can be done that can improve the world. So the fact that Stephen Moore uh, is, is one of his economic advisors. Stephen Moore's pretty good in economics. He's not great, but he's pretty good in economics. Now, will he have any influence? I don't know. Art Laffer is a pretty good economist. He's advising Donald Trump. Now, I didn't see either one of those in the transition team. So I doubt that they're going to have a lot of influence on, uh, on uh, Donald Trump. I have uh, more of a sense, if you think about who he's, I, I find this really, really funny. But the guy who's supposedly the number one candidate for Treasury Secretary, I want to drum roll. Guess, guess, guess what? He's a former Goldman Sachs guy. 
I just find that so funny because like everybody, one of the big things that people are so upset about is that Goldman Sachs has such a big role in our country and all the treasury secretaries have been from Goldman Sachs and, and now Donald Trump, who's supposed to be this new phenomena, who's supposed to be completely different, is Goldman Sachs, going back to Goldman Sachs. Um, but a, a lot of the people he's going to bring in on economic policies are going to be businessmen who don't know anything about economics. Um, and uh, they're going to bring people in uh, on trade. And all these people are going to be is, is super, super uh, cronies. They're going to favor their own industry just like, you know, just like, uh, um, oh my God, today I'm, I'm doing terrible in age. Just like Paulson, when he was, when he was Treasury Secretary, favored Goldman over Lehman and had a buy. These guys are going to come from industry. They have no principles. They have no real solid fundamental economic ideas. And they're going to start cutting deals. They're going to be deal makers. And deal making is the last thing you need when it comes to actually setting policy. It's really, what I'm turning out is it's really hard for me to be positive. Because the more I know about the, 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 at least the rumors about the administration, the less positive, um, less positive I become. But look, there's a chance that they redo Obamacare and they do something much better. There's a chance that they will deregulate. I don't think they're going to deregulate in mass, but they'll deregulate certain aspects of it. They won't completely change Dodd-Frank, but they'll take out the worst provisions in it. The Consumer Protection Act, which is, uh, um, which is the left's kind of favorite institution because it is not supervised by Congress. It gets a budget from the Fed. It's like this little autonomous dictatorial entity, one of the worst things to count out of Dodd-Frank. That, that might be shut down. That would be terrific if it's shut down. And I know the guy who was going to be, I don't know if he still is, but was going to be in the transition team around the Consumer Protection Agency. And, and if that's shut down, that would be huge. Uh, there are a lot of things that the Trump administration is not going to go after private education, after colleges, private colleges like the Obama administration, or like a Hill administration would have done. So there were a lot of positives in the specifics. I don't know. I mean, he's going to start building a wall. There's no question. The wall is going to take a decade to build is my prediction. He's going to, but he's going to start building the wall, which is going to be stupid. I don't know that he's going to be able to do much on trade. He'll do some damage on trade, but not huge. I think on the specific issues, he's not going to do a lot of damage. But we need to be vigilant. We need to be watch him. Because nobody else is going to watch him. There's nobody else out there to watch him. I mean, some Republicans are better, but many of them are going to be caught up in his tailwinds. Because not only did he win, they won the House and the Senate with him, which suggests that the American people want him. And a lot of politicians are just whatever you want, right? They're just empty. So I'm counting on the better Republicans to, you know, constrain Donald Trump to some extent. But we're going to have to raise our voices. We're going to have to fight him. We're going to have to present better ideas. We're going to have to talk about a real secular right. We're going to have to talk about the importance of secularism, the, the danger of religion. We've been too timid in talking about it in the past. And we're going to have to talk about free markets to those people who tend to be secular and who are not convinced by free market and explain them and be patient and walk them through it. We're going to have to find the people out there who still respect reason and give them ammunition. The future is going to be about a battle between reason and emotionalism. Emotionalism derived from mysticism. Emotionalism just derived from emotion. Almost all emotion is derived ultimately from mysticism of some form or another. So this is about reason versus mysticism. And it's about individualism versus collectivism. And this is going to be a tough one for many people. Because one of the things that appeals about Donald Trump is he's going to make America great again. He's about America, and we all are about America. But his America is a collectivistic America, and the left's America is a collectivistic America. So again, there's a few of us, not that many, who advocate for individualism. So, 
We need individualism, secularism, we need reason, we need free markets, we need a new movement to fight for these ideas, and we need to get more aggressive about the fight. Our lives are literally at stake, this generation's lives are at stake, our political, uh, our future is at stake. So um, the best way for you guys to help out is A, stop demonizing Silicon Valley. B, contribute to the Ayn Rand Institute uh, and help us promote these ideas. Help us promote these ideas. Help us to get on the Dave Rubin Show. I could actually, if I had the money, here's a, here's a fundraising uh, shtick. Did I just pick my nose on, um, on Facebook Live? I need to be really careful. Um, here's the, here's the, uh, here's the, uh, here's the shtick. We could actually do a whole program with, uh, with uh, Dave Rubin. We could do a whole series of shows focused on objectivist ideas, on objectivist principles. We just need the money to do it, right? He would dedicate a whole stream for us, a whole channel, if you will, on his network to do this. And, um, and we need money for that. Basically, what we need a fund. So, einrand.org slash support. Uh, contribute some money. You can you can allocate it to the radio show. You can allocate it to Dave Rubin. You can allocate it to whatever you want, or you can just make it open. Uh, send us checks. Send us money. You can sign up for a monthly contribution, a weekly contribution, a daily contribution, whatever works. But we need uh, we need really what we need is is funds to be able to challenge the crazy world that exists today, the crazy ideas that are dominating the world today. This is fundamentally not about politics. This is fundamentally about, you know, these these basic ideas that we talked about: individualism versus collectivism, reason versus mysticism. And if there's one issue, and I'll end with this, that we need to fight, fight, fight on, that we need to defend with everything that we have, it is the issue of free speech. All right, we're all done for today. I have to go prepare for my next show in uh, in an hour, which. Um, I don't know. We'll have to, I'll have to think about whether I'm going to do that Facebook Live as well. But I'll consider it. Uh, we'll talk about that in, uh, in, uh, in an hour on AM 560 in Chicago. Talk to you soon, all. I'll be back uh, same time, same place next week. Right. Where's the, where's the closing music? There it is. Thanks, guys, on Facebook Live. We're ending it.